Here's a question. Has the U.S. economy been expanding? Has it stayed static or did it contract this year? Well, for the answers now, we turn, as we always do, to our chief equity strategist and economist, John Blank. John, where do those answers lie to those questions? I, I think based on what you've written recently, the answers seem to lie in a few metrics, right? What are they? So um, we got uh, a print, a foreprint on the Q3 GDP today, and it included strong consumption growth above, you know, above or or three percent annually. Um, that's a strong economy in any any context. It's certainly a strong economy when the world economy that our peers are in are vastly underperforming that. So bottom line is, at least through the end of September, we're all, we're talking October the 26th. The U.S. economy is in great shape, and a lot of that also has to do with the circularity between the strong and tight job market and the incomes that are coming out of it that then can be passed into consumption without too much worry. And that's what's keeping this thing going. So going into that GDP report this morning, it was expected to show economic growth. Obviously, that was confirmed, right? Correct. Um, what was fascinating about it is the actual Atlanta Fed GDP now, which gets talked down you know, perpetually, was it? 4.9, 5.1 for, for multiple months. And in fact, that it basically delivered a, a proper answer, you know, high four number from this report, 4.9. And uh, so that actually, you know, again, people say the government's forecasting abilities are poor. And then, of course, when it's not poor, they don't discuss that. But we should. It was perfect. But does that report, that data in that report represent a high watermark for growth this year? I think it does. I think it's it's a summer report. It's a revenge travel, you know, tinted report. And it also has a lot of inventory restocking that has showing, you know, the bottom of the COVID supply shutdown event, which was 13 months long in PMIs. We also saw it pick up. We saw the manufacturing PMIs turn to 50 in the United States, first time in multiple months, barely over 50. But that's part of this inventory restocking event, which means that basically there's a a more sanguine view about how to run businesses. You don't need to have you know massive amounts of inventory laying around because you just don't know if you're going to get a part from somebody. And tomorrow, the 27th of October, gives us a look at the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. You see any possible surprises there? Core PCE and broad PCE, Terry, we need to point out to people is what the Fed cares about. This comes from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. What comes out of these other things is from different groups, typically the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS and CPI. So the Fed cares about the economy. That's why it likes this economy-wide view. And it's it's consumption prices, not government prices. That's the other thing to understand. So yeah, um, it is going to be watched now that we know that consumption growth was so strong in Q3 today. So it will be interesting to see if it takes that core PC number up and not down, it, it won't surprise me, it, you know, not if I'm not talking a big move up, but a, a tenth or two tenths move up could happen here, Terry. So based on the data that we've outlined, uh, bottom line, are we looking at expansion in the economy for this year? Absolutely. 2.1% real growth rate is the consensus expectation in London in October, and I support that view. And is the trend going to continue into the new year? And if it does, how far into the new year? Well, Terry, I mean, this. everybody loves to push the bearishness out another year the last three years. Uh, so now we're talking, you know, the third year of bears pushing it out. Um, the basic problem with bearishness is why is next year different than this one? Uh, if the answer is just a calendar year is ticked off, it's not a very strong answer. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind here is the Federal Reserve System in the trading mind is going to cut rates, you know, 50 basis points in two moves in the last half of this next year in the face of declining inflation and in the, in the face of a U.S. presidential election in November. It's very hard in my mind with politic, what's called political business cycles, meaning trying to keep the economy in line with a strong election result. That, that they that everybody wants to do a face plant in the second half of 2024. I don't get that. I don't think people should count on that. Um, it certainly can happen. Uh, the economy doesn't have to listen to anybody, and, it, and we certainly have high rates for a long enough time, particularly now at the, at the, the critical five and 10 year tenures of, of bonds where what financing really matters. But again, 
why then and why why suddenly and why big? I don't really get the answer to that. Big tech earnings also out this week or expected to shed light on the economic story. What did they tell? Basically, that what we already know uh, that you know the cloud businesses are their, their core drivers, and what they used to do twenty years ago is not as interesting. So Microsoft Word and the Office product not so interesting as their cloud business. Amazon and their internet sales not so interesting as Amazon Web Service and Google and their search not so interesting relative to their Azure play in this space. So got to understand that the backbone infrastructure of the, the infotech world uh, in twenty twenty three has found its way into these same businesses. And that's the story of why these seven big seven stocks keep going. With economic growth here expected this year, then will the U.S. economy avoid a hard landing? It's all based on the job market tightness, Terry. Um, and, you know, you got to remember the 90s, uh, we had an extra million on continuing claims throughout the 90s versus now. And it can say it's different, but you know, in a pre-internet context, it certainly is different, Terry. And in a post-COVID context, it's also different. So you got two sources of information that are actually telling you that they, they have a higher probability of a soft landing than than people who are using, you know, 30 years of historical analysis are counting on. Strong buy stocks you've written about recently include Neurocrine Biosciences, Williams Sonoma, and MCOR Group. Yeah, ticker NBIX. Uh, I love this stock. You got to find your way into it. It gets range traded a lot, um, but it's in a real interesting business area. And, um, you know, it's got products and it makes actual money, which you don't often see in these businesses. You know, current year estimates for $2.12. Peg ratio of one. Um, buy the stock on weakness and we're seeing some of that. So ticker NBIX, growth of A in our system. Growth of B in our system, William Sonoma, also a Zach's number two rank, and an A for value. Um, I love William Sonoma as a retail play. We already talked about the strong consumer. Um, so why not pick up some William Sonoma at 147 today? It's selling off. Might be a nice time. Um, you know, this chart looks pretty good for that one. MCOR, ticker EME, number one ranked stock with a B for growth. MCOR is getting pounded down of late. I see it going for 225 to the 190s, and now it's back to 200. Um, nice entry point for MCOR. This is your typical infrastructure play, uh, and it's got both the short and long-term you know, metrics that, that forecast it's going to do fine for the next year. Got to love MCOR, ticker EME. Our chief equity strategist and economist, John Blank, with his latest economic view. With John, I'm Terry Ruffalo. Here's something you can view. Just released, five stocks set to double, where four Zacks experts each announced their single favorite pick with potential to gain 100% and more in the months ahead. You can download the private special report that names these stocks and spotlights why their upside is so exceptional. You can do that at zacks.com slash promo. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.